Today, October 22, is a very significant day in the history of our beginnings. Welcome to the Evidence History Podcast. This is Season 2, Episode 40, Questions on Doctrine, Part 4. Last time we talked about the final meetings between the Evangelicals and the Adventists in their efforts to determine whether Adventists were human. I mean, Evangelical Christians. We talked about Leroy Froome's efforts to stamp down on Adventist mixed messaging and to present a united front. And we talked about the plan to publish a series of articles in Barnhouse's Eternity magazine, giving the results of these conferences. Now, Martin was to follow up, uh, follow up all of this with a book about Seventh-day Adventists, and Adventists were to follow that book up with a book of their own, a book that would become Questions on Doctrine. The first of these articles came out as planned, with Barnhouse announcing that Adventists were indeed Christians. Let's begin by taking a few steps back back to when young Walter Martin went to visit his boss and friend, Donald Gray Barnhouse, to convince Barnhouse that Avenus deserved a fair hearing. Now, Martin describes the conversation this way. Quote, You taught me that the unity of the body of Christ was the primary task of Christians and that we are to maintain that unity. He said, Correct. I said, Now, if... These people are members of the body of Christ, and we treat them as enemies. God can't bless us. And he said, that's true. And I said, let's find out. Let me find out. Do you trust me? Absolutely, he said. I said, then let me find out. And he said, do it. End quote. Now, Martin was recalling this conversation decades after Barnhouse's death, and I'm sure Martin is truncating this conversation, right? It puts Barnhouse in a rather passive role, which probably wasn't exactly how it happened, but no doubt the substance is, is probably accurate. And it helps us to, to locate the fulcrum around which everything else in our story pivots. Trust. Did Barnhouse trust Martin enough to be open to wherever his research led, to back up his conclusions? Did the GC leaders trust Martin enough to open up to him? Did Adventist members trust their leaders enough that they would represent their faith well? Did evangelical readers of eternity trust their leaders, their editors, to represent their faith well? Because in the end, this is about trust. Now, Barnhouse's first article about Adventists appeared in September 1956 in Eternity magazine. Before Barnhouse declared Adventists to be Christians, he explained the fruit of those meetings to the evangelical readers like a politician making peace to end a war. He knew the concerns that evangelicals had because he had shared them. Many of these concerns will be familiar, just to remind you, concerns over Ellen White's writings being equal to the Bible, concerns over whether you need to keep the Sabbath to be saved, concerns over whether Adventists think they are the only remnant church, the only people who are going to be saved, concerns about whether Adventists taught that Satan was the scapegoat, the sin-bearer in the Day of Atonement typology. Concern over Adventist evangelists, including HMS Richards' popular Voice of Prophecy program, not identifying themselves as Adventists. That was something that bothered evangelicals an awful lot. And beyond all of that, there was this palpable annoyance among evangelical readers uh, and leaders that Adventists proselytize those evangelical church members. For instance, evangelical missionaries, they go overseas, they, they work hard to evangelize people just for Adventists to show up in their mission field and steal some of those converts. And it's like, hey, Focus on the other people, the unreached people. Don't just show up just to steal Sunday Christians, okay? And that really bothered evangelicals a lot. Now, Barnhouse acted as if he won reassurances or concessions from Adventists on all of these issues. A reassurance that Adventists did not see Ellen White's writings as equal to the Bible and did not believe you had to keep the Sabbath to be saved. And a concession that the voice of prophecy and signs of the times would now start identifying themselves as Adventists. So Barnhouse writes this first article kind of like, see, this is the fruit of all of our labor. They reassured us this. They promised that. 
They clarified this. You know, we're in a better spot now. We understand them better, and, and life is going to be better for us as evangelicals as well because of these conferences. Now, in true Barnhouse fashion, after spending a good 50% of the article explaining all that he thought strange or objectionable about Adventism, he finally admitted in the final paragraph that he was, quote, delighted to do justice to a much maligned group of sincere believers, end quote, and to call them Christians. You can almost feel his delight. Almost. Now, Martin took over in, in October 1956 to talk about the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, including the role of Ellen White in that history. He largely avoids the debate over Ellen White, arguing, quote, to refute Ellen G. White either as a person or theologically is certainly not to refute Seventh-day Adventism per se, for there are schools of interpretation within the Seventh-day Adventist movement which disagree with Ellen G. White's interpretations on some points, end quote. Who were these Adventists who disagreed with Ellen White? Martin doesn't say. Now, Martin's second article appeared in November 1956 and answered the question of whether Adventism's distinctive theology disqualified it from being considered Christian. Martin divided it all up into three neat categories. First are what he called the cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith, things like the Trinity, virgin birth, and so on. The next category was alternative views on secondary things very catchy. To him, that means Calvinism versus Arminianism, or historicist eschatology versus futurist eschatology. The third category was made up of truly unique doctrines belonging to Adventism, like the inspiration of Ellen White and the investigative judgment. Martin assured the readers that in the first category, the one that mattered to him the most, Adventists were orthodox, Martin represented his efforts as the only serious study of Adventism, knowing that evangelicals held popular misconceptions about Adventists, popular prejudices that would be hard to dislodge. Martin closed with a Parthian shot at his fellow evangelicals. Quote, in order to have something to say against Adventism, many have been content to say anything. End quote. Now, Martin's final article, his third one, was more of the same. It again examined the controversial bits of Adventist theology, took another shot at his fellow evangelicals just for fun, and Martin charged that some, and here he was thinking of men like Lewis Talbot, I believe, repeated the lazy slander against Adventists in order to sell books and tracts. True Seventh-day Adventism, Martin said, quote, despite its differences from us, is one with us, in the great work of winning men to Jesus Christ, end quote. Now, there was one more article in the series written by Donald Gray Barnhouse, which we will discuss in, I don't know, 20 minutes. Um, but the reaction that flooded eternity came because of the first four articles. These Adventist Evangelical Conferences and the books and articles that followed ignited a new interest within evangelicalism to talk about Adventists, and sometimes to know more about Seventh-day Adventists. On the last day of 1956, Time Magazine published three articles on religion, three short articles toward the back. The first article reported on a text found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, which described a freshly born Noah coming out of the womb and immediately talking with God. So, yeah, that image will keep you up at night. The second story was about, and I kid you not, I kid you not, how a Jesuit doctoral student named Robert Busa wanted to study all of the uses of the word in, in the writings of Thomas Aquinas. That's right, in, I-N. This Jesuit spent four years on the project, but was unable to finish because people use the word in a lot. So he went to America, he met Thomas J. Watson, the founder of IBM, and then devoted the next seven years to working with IBM nerds in order to input all of the writings of Thomas Aquinas into an IBM computer so he could find every occurrence where Thomas Aquinas used the word in, as well as the immediate context, six words before the word in, six words after the word in, and after 11 years on this project, 
And with all 10,000 of the punch cards of Thomas Aquinas' writings inserted into the computer, the search still took another 8,125 hours, nearly a year, to complete. In 1997, Busa admitted that he had spent 1.8 million hours of labor on this project over his lifetime. And to that, I just want to say, dude, just use Google next time. The third religion story in time that week was entitled Peace with the Adventists. Now, as you might expect, it covered the rapprochement between Barnhouse Martin and the Adventists. In an unfortunate turn of phrase for Adventists, the article reads, quote, as a result of his, meaning Martin's, researches, fundamentalists have stretched out a hand and the Seventh-day Adventists have accepted it gladly, end quote. Now, I say it's unfortunate because... Ellen White wrote a well-known warning in Great Controversy about Protestants reaching their hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of Catholicism. And, well, Catholics aren't involved in this article, but the idea of Protestants reaching their hand out to grab Adventists instead must have unsettled the few Adventists who were were aware of this Ellen White statement. Anyways, the, the article also included this line, quote, defending their sectarianism in an unfriendly world made Adventists a prickly people, end quote. I suppose that is true to an extent. Adventists could be very defensive and aggressive toward other Christians, but really, Time Magazine, have you met the fundamentalists? However tepid the feelings for Adventism in Time, some evangelicals nevertheless saw the Time article as a strong endorsement of Adventism, I guess because Adventists were mentioned. Jan Carol von Balen a Calvinist who, like Walter Martin, was a well-known author in the counter-cult movement, declared that Adventist, Adventist theology, especially the theology of the investigative judgment, quote, is not the innocent little hobby of Seventh-day Adventists that Barnhouse and Martin and Time magazine would have us believe that it is, end quote. Von Balen began, like many fundamentalists slash evangelicals of their day, of his day, with a hermeneutic of suspicion toward Adventists. When Von Balen learned that Adventists were going to publish what he called an 800-page statement of their beliefs, what would be titled Questions on Doctrine, and it was really only 720, so let's not exaggerate here. He was positively conspiratorial. Quote, Is this perhaps to make confusion more confounded? Most creedal statements are brief, to the point, boiled down, and clear-cut. End quote. Is von Balen really annoyed or suspicious because Questions on Doctrine is too long? Adventists are explaining too much? You know, I mean, what? If questions on doctrine were like 20 pages, or 100 pages even, would he just turn around and argue that it it wasn't enough of an explanation? You know, they're hiding too much, we're not getting enough out of them. But now that it's 700 plus pages, it's too long, you guys are trying to confuse confused people by publishing this overly long book that that is just going to go in circles, I guess, and and no one's going to read because it's too long. I... What do you want? Just what do you want from us, buddy? (laughs) Besides, overly long books, eh, it's kind of our thing. Time was in its heyday in the 1950s with millions of subscribers. Eternity, on the other hand, only had about 33,000 subscribers. By contrast, just to kind of situate that number, the Adventist Signs of the Times magazine gained 40,000 subscribers in just the first nine months of 1957. All right. Science's overall subscription base was was 10 times that of eternity. But but eternity had its finger on the evangelical pulse. People who were people in the evangelical movement read eternity. And after reading Martin and Barnhouse's articles about Adventists, that pulse was racing. The pivot toward embracing Adventists almost destroyed eternity. 11,000 subscribers, one-third of all their subscribers, canceled their subscription. Herbert S. Byrd wrote an epic letter to the editor. It was long, and it outlined the reasons why he didn't think Avenus should be considered evangelical. In the end, he compared Avenus' desire for friendship to that of the Soviet Union. And an Avenus wrote back saying, yeah, not a great comparison. One woman called Eternity's position on Avenus nothing short of absurd, and suggested that eternity was tied to this Avenus heresy. Another person demanded that Avenus apologize for their heresy before they would be considered Christians. Some 
of Eternity's readers weren't content sending their letters to the magazine. One woman, a former Avenist, it turns out, began writing both to Barnhouse and to the General Conference President, Ruben Figur, venting her frustrations. Martin responded to some of these points directly. Barnhouse responded more generally, preaching about Christian unity and the sin of prejudice. Now, Barnhouse did go after Martin's old nemesis, Louis Talbot. Talbot hadn't softened up a bit since he met Froome at the Prophecy Congress, which we talked about in our last episode. If anything, he doubled down by mailing thousands of tracts asking, is Barnhouse right? Spoiler alert, he doesn't think Barnhouse is right. It seems that Barnhouse had Talbot squarely in mind when he growled about prejudice in the church. Now, as I said, this controversy prompted a wider discussion in evangelicalism. The Sunday School Times published a lion's share of a 52-page tract against Adventism. The author concluded that Adventism was not worth a moment's consideration. Articles in the magazine Our Hope supported eternity and welcomed Adventists to the evangelical fold. The blowback hit the editors of Our Hope as well. The Baptist pastor blasted Barnhouse and Martin for compromising, quote, all that is evangelical, end quote. All of it. The manager of a Christian bookstore wrote that he will no longer carry Our Hope because, quote, we can have no part in this deception, end quote. Some mocked the editor, E. Schuyler English, for becoming an Adventist. To balance things out, English commissioned an evangelical missionary to write seven articles against Adventism for our hope. Martin gave an interview to a magazine called Christian Life. In response, E.B. Jones himself, that ex avenist whom Barnhouse had leaned on to support his anti avenist views, wrote to call Martin gullible and that avenist had deceived him. And this ended up being the crossroads of the struggle. Barnhouse and Martin argued that evangelicals owed it to everybody to get their facts straight, to reject prejudice, and to come with an open mind. People like Jones and others argue that you can't trust Adventists, and if you come with an open mind, they're going to deceive you because that's what they do. So it came down to, will you trust the work that Barnhouse and Martin did, or will you give in to your suspicions and fears about Adventists? Because in the end, this is about trust. Now, Martin DeHaan, the, the, the best-selling author at Zondervan, and I mean the best-selling author at Zondervan. This is where, of course, Martin, Walter Martin worked. And, and DeHaan summoned Martin, and in Martin's words, quote, chewed me out for 45 minutes as only DeHaan could, end quote. DeHaan threatened to not publish another book with the two Zondervan brothers if they printed Martin's book on Seventh-day Adventism. The Zondervan brothers replied, according to Martin, quote, well, DeHaan, we don't want to lose you, we love you, and that means a great deal to us. But if Walter is telling the truth, this is a landmark issue. We want to get out there and tell the truth about it. It is really a breakthrough, and we are going to print it. End quote. It made no difference. In 1960, DeHaan would dismiss the Adventist Evangelical Conferences in two lines. Quote, Seventh-day Adventism has not changed one iota. It is the same bigoted movement of error and clever deception it has been from its inception. End quote. Lewis Talbot brought gasoline to the party and proceeded to spread it everywhere. He released his own series of articles in the King's Business called Why Seventh-day Adventism is Not Evangelical. Talbot repeated claims that he had been making for years and years and years, apparently not trusting anything Barnhouse or Martin had reported from their conversations with Adventist leaders. Every single thing Talbot wrote had already been addressed by the Adventist leaders during these conferences, either, either directly, either Adventists had written about it themselves, or through Martin and Barnhouse. Talbot showed absolutely no interest. Taking the pulpit of a petty demagogue, Talbot said Eternity's shameful betrayal, and, and, and that Martin and Barnhouse were responsible for all the souls who would be lost because of this. Talbot appreciated the words of another evangelical, probably DeHaan, if you ask me, who called it the greatest shock I have received in my ministry. Talbot labeled Adventist doctrine as poisonous, called Adventist fanatics, and lamented their terrible heresies, as opposed to the, I guess, the good heresies that you can have. Quote, 
In reading their arguments, one is impressed that there is indeed something satanic about such a rabid brand of religiosity, end quote. The managing editor of the King's Business added an article of his own, calling it a personal message to Seventh-day Adventists. Of course, it wasn't a message to all Seventh-day Adventists, as he made abundantly clear in his very first sentence. Quote, this personal message is only for those few Seventh-day Adventists who are not afraid to test God's word, end quote. Hey, buddy, now that you've insulted me, let me hear what you have to say. What he had to say was naive. He asked Adventist members to pray and to read the Bible for two weeks, forgetting their Adventism, not reading any footnotes or Ellen White, and just trust that the Holy Spirit would lead them to a different path. While these evangelical editors twirled their pens and called fire down on each other from their dueling heights in the ivory towers, below local evangelicals found ways to weigh in as well. In Duluth, Minnesota, a pastor stopped by an evangelical bookstore to pick up a copy of Eternity. He grabbed the September issue, the, the one where Barnhouse's first article appears, and then reached for his money. The cashier stopped him. I was told, the pastor wrote, quote, that the issue was not being sold because of the compromising article about Seventh-day Adventism, end quote. The same thing happened at other evangelical bookstores across the country. They weren't going to sell eternity so long as these pro avenist articles were in them. Christianity Today, which is relatively brand new on the scene, published several articles both about Adventism and by Seventh-day Adventists themselves. And as a new evangelical publication, it avoided the acidic tone of Talbot's tirades. Herbert Byrd, who had written a critical letter to eternity about Adventists, he resumed his argument in Christianity Today. Bird was a missionary and had a pretty pretty good grasp of Adventism, I would say. While he didn't think Adventists should be considered, in his words, just another evangelical denomination, Bird admired Adventists on several fronts. He called Adventist zeal astonishing and said that the army of Adventist literature evangelists and students should make evangelicals jealous because Adventists really got the concept of the priesthood of all believers. But most of all, Bird admired that Adventists had standards. You couldn't drink coffee. You had to observe the Sabbath strictly. They asked for 10% of your income as tithe and then more besides as offerings. And yet, Bird said, they're still one of the fastest growing Christian groups in the world. We shouldn't be lowering our standards as evangelicals because look at them. They have higher standards than we do. They have more rules than we do, and they're growing like crazy. Now, Avenus felt they had been vindicated. And as we will talk about, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next episode. But the fierce backlash that accompanied that vindication made it clear that it was only a partial vindication. Evangelicals were willing to go to war with each other in order to preserve the opinion that Adventism was a cult. This opinion wasn't going to be changed because the Adventist Church published questions on doctrine either. It's not that Lewis Talbot was waiting for better arguments from the Adventists, okay? <laughs> Many Adventists today have good relationships with evangelicals and vice versa. Local Christian schools are happy to accept Adventist students today, and they, they often will make accommodation for, for Sabbath or for whatever other things, Adventists are, uh, you know, vegetarianism, whatever it may be. But, you know, and, and I would imagine, just in all fairness, there's probably a lot of evangelical schools that were okay with Adventists in the 1950s as well. But it's important to understand that it wasn't always so easy for Adventists to be heard, to be welcomed, to be accepted in, in Christian circles, especially evangelical circles. Even today, on YouTube, you'll find dozens of videos, very easily, by the way, of prominent evangelicals casually calling Adventists a cult like it's no big deal. Those evangelicals may not have the influence their forefathers had, but the feeling has never quite gone away. And when we talk about the blowback from the evangelical Adventist conferences, we're talking about something that is still happening. Now, it makes you wonder if the editor of Time, who had written that original article, they had titled Peace with Adventists. It makes you wonder if they had noticed that evangelicals were tearing each other to shreds 
over this so-called peace with Adventists. The Time article included the line that read, quote, It has taken a long time to bury the enmities. End quote. But were they buried? Not all of the letters were negative, of course. One writer from Canada didn't understand all of the controversy. He said, hey, I'm a Baptist. I don't agree with, with those who baptize infants. But don't we still consider them fellow Christians? Yeah, we have differences with the Adventists, but why does that stop us from considering them fellow Christians? He wrote, quote, we need to have more love, end quote. <laughs> An economist wrote approvingly to Eternity to say that he had met a fellow economist and Adventist at an event some years back, neither of them drank, so they, they naturally bonded with each other drinking drinking pop, or, well, he said soda, but I'm from the Midwest, so it's pop. And and he realized that this Adventist colleague was a fellow Christian. As Eternity bled subscribers, however, the executive secretary of the publisher wrote a letter to set the record straight. He said that 70% of all the letters Eternity had received about Avenus were in fact positive, but they just didn't print all the positive stuff because, well, I mean, the articles themselves were fairly positive about Avenus, and so they wanted to be balanced, so they, they, they published the, a lot of these negative articles just to show some sort of editorial integrity here. Now, the, uh, the executive secretary for the publisher went on, you know, we're letting you guys know 70% of the letters are, are positive, okay? It's not so dire. But nevertheless, why don't you take advantage of the Christmas season and buy a subscription for a friend? <laughs> it's like, you know, we want to put on a brave face here, but we really need you to subscribe. 70% <laughs> of the letters may have been positive, but 33% of the subscribers leaving was not positive, okay? You can write all the nice letters you want, but <laughs> so long as a third of your readers are canceling their subscriptions... Uh, that, that's probably a statistic that matters a little bit more. Yet Barnhouse and Martin, to their credit, stuck to their guns. And they said that by 1958, they had gained more subscribers than they have ever had. And it is rumored that many of those new subscribers were Adventists. Even today, it's unclear how the majority of evangelicals felt about these events. Many evangelicals had clearly come to know Adventists personally, and that sort of disarmed them spiritually. Whatever E.B. Jones would have them believe about Adventists being trained to deceive you, uh, which is, is kind of funny when you read this, because all this kind of uh, Jesuit hyping that Adventists do, this is basically what E.B. Jones is saying about Adventists. <laughs> like they're you know they're just they're 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 masters at deception they're masters at spiritual camouflage um you know they'll infiltrate and and change things that it wasn't real big on the infiltration theme i guess but um you know the, it's just i guess turned about as fair play anyways whatever he would have you believe about Adventists being trained to deceive you those evangelicals the everyday evangelicals came to see their Adventist friends as fellow christians many of them did not all of them many of them did because for them it really wasn't about doctrine it was about decency friendship more than argument broke walls of prejudice where barnhouse and martin pushed on that prejudice they found that a surprising number of the readers had already come to the same conclusions they had not on the basis of devoting thousands of hours to study the issue, but just based on knowing real living Adventists and working with them and seeing they're just like me. Maybe they're a little bit weird here and a little bit weird there, but they're just like me. They have integrity. They care about me. What's the big deal? So it's worth realizing that books like Questions on Doctrine or Barnhouse and Martin's Articles in Eternity they were written for a certain type of evangelical, an intellectually engaged kind, somebody who takes the doctrines very, very seriously and you know, wants to make sure people are, are, are in line with them on every particular point. Now, is, is, would that describe most evangelicals? Are most Adventists like that? 
Are they worried about the broad landscape of doctrine and where every hill and dip is, right? We want to map this out. Well, perhaps not. But for those who controlled the ink and pen, this was a controversy. And since the ink and pen has been preserved, we might be tempted to think that this controversy consumed more of people's attention back then than it really did. Again, we just don't know how the majority of Adventists and the majority of evangelicals felt about such things. We just see the people trying to work them up, and we see the people trying to calm them down. And of course, we have a number of letters from readers, people who like to be theologically informed and and up to date on what preacher so-and-so is teaching these days, right? And and what's going on over here. Those, Those theological enthusiasts, they care. But, you know, did the housewife in the pew, did the unemployed man in the pew care as much about these things? We just don't know. And so we ought to be careful when we see the, the fire coming from Talbot or Dahan or somebody else. We, we, we ought not just say, wow, all of these people felt this way. No, not all of these people, certainly. It could be a majority. It could be a very vocal minority. We just don't know how, how widespread these feelings were. Now, it wasn't until the end of 1957 that Donald Gray Barnhouse picked up his pen to uh, publish a final article in the series. Martin's book was supposed to have arrived at the end of 1956. It didn't. Questions and Doctrine was supposed to arrive a month later, in January of 1957. It didn't. Perhaps Barnhouse was waiting for Questions and Doctrine to finally appear, which it did later on in 1957, a full year after Barnhouse's first article. Barnhouse's postscript, that's what he called it, was basically an introduction to QOD. But he added this insight. Quote, Eternity lost some subscribers by telling the truth about the Adventists. This we regret. We feel sure that this was due to an apparent misunderstanding of the issue. We are delighted, however, that many who canceled have renewed their subscription because they have come to understand the matter and realized that we were motivated by Christian love. End quote. What was at stake here for Barnhouse was a matter of justice. For his entire life, the man wanted to be correct about everything and to correct others as well. (laughs) And if there was a possibility that Adventists were being, as he would later put it, maligned and persecuted for decades by him and his fellow evangelicals, well, then he wanted to set the record straight. And if he lost some subscribers from it, then so be it. It was an issue of Christian integrity to him. And despite the the mortal financial threat that this integrity posed to his magazine and the loss of respect he might suffer from his friends, Barnhouse felt it paid off in the end. Barnhouse quoted an Adventist as having said, quote, the editors of Eternity have communicated more with us in two years than the whole Protestant church did in over a hundred years because they came to us in the spirit of Christian love, end quote. Now that last bit uh, wasn't exactly true, was it? Martin recalled him and Froome yelling at each other in some of their meetings and Roy Anderson sitting there and saying, now brethren, we must be calm here. I don't know why my Roy Allen Anderson voice sounds a little bit like Ronald Reagan. Anyways, the the point is, Martin didn't exactly show up with an olive branch, okay? (laughs) He didn't show up in the spirit of Christian love. But, But that's how it turned out, and I suppose the rough start can be forgiven. Barnhouse went on from quoting that Avenus to say, quote, More than I can say, I am glad for this, because this is the crowning desire of my life that men shall know that we are his disciples because we love one another, end quote. You know what, Donald Gray Barnhouse? You turned out just fine. Long after Unruh, Barnhouse, Reed, and Froome were dead, Martin remembered these days with a passion. To this day, he told someone, quote, I don't think I have met four finer men of Christian integrity than R.A. Anderson 
T.E. Unruh, L.E. Froome, and W.E. Reed, or for that matter, Ted Heppenstall. More on him later. Men of God who really worked earnestly trying to find answers. They realized that separation between members of the body of Christ on peripheral theology is sin. And this sin had to be cleared away. The debris had to be cleaned up. And if there was a real basis then, there should be fellowship. End quote. Martin, like Barnhouse, saw a moral imperative in the situation. For Christians to be separated like this on minor issues is sin, he says. We have to sort through this debris and figure out if there is just cause for our separation. For many Adventists, like many evangelicals we read about today, there was just cause. Evangelicals had rejected the truth of the Sabbath, of the sanctuary, of the three angels' message, and in the past, they had helped pass Sunday laws. And local preachers, oh man, story after story after story of local Sunday preachers, of evangelical preachers who opposed the Adventist message wherever they could, telling their members, don't go to those Adventist meetings. For these Adventists, uh, all that history just couldn't disappear. The theological issues that Martin considered peripheral or anything but peripheral to these Adventists. These Adventists were, 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 were feeling that same sense of betrayal by Leroy Froome and the gang that, that evangelicals felt with Barnhouse and Martin. They didn't trust them. In fact, they didn't know who they could trust at the general conference. Maybe they were all in on it. Was this part of the last days? These, these questions and more coalesced and were given life by one man, Millie and Loritz Andreasen. And Andreasen would speak for the concerned. He would champion their cause. Maybe he would help save the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Because in the end, it's all about trust. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you.